welcome to another off the shelf board game review. This week we're going to look at an expansion to Lords of Waterdeep, a game that came out in 2012. This is actually the first expansion for the game and it's called Scoundrels of Skullport. It's actually two expansions in one that adds a quite a few cool things to the original game. First of all, and most importantly, it allows you to play with six players. So now Lords of Waterdeep is now a two to six player game. The new faction that comes with the game is the Grey Hands, which if you're familiar with the stories from the Forgotten Realms and the City of Waterdeep, you're going to be familiar with the history, and again, it adds more to the theme. This is a board game based on the Forgotten Realms, Dungeons & Dragons role-playing setting, so a lot of the theme comes from that role-playing game and that world and that fantasy realm. Now this expansion comes with the obligatory new buildings, the new lords, brand new intrigue cards and of course new quest cards but the really cool thing about this game is it adds a new mechanic to the game called corruption corruption is an awesome mechanic that's been added to the game and i don't want to get into it too much just a quick overview just know that corruption is a little bit cool way to allow you to press your luck risk getting extra points for some great rewards but you got to face that corruption is this expansion more of the same or does it improve the gameplay of Lords of Waterdeep? Stay tuned to find out. Lords of Waterdeep Scoundrels of Skullport is actually two expansions in one box. And the cool thing about this is that you can play each expansion individually or you can play both the expansions together to make a really large game. And not only that, they actually have more rules to make an extended game. Now, they call it a longer game, but in all honesty, it only adds probably about 25 or 30 minutes to the overall length of the game. So you're looking at taking a game that already takes about an hour and 15 minutes to probably about an hour and 45 or maybe even an hour and a half, depending on how the game goes. Most of my games have been ending about the hour and a half to hour and 45 mark, even using all the new expansions. The Scoundrels of Skullport expansion retails for $40, and for that $40, you're getting quite a lot of extra stuff to add to the game. Now, you're probably wondering right off the bat, does the original game fit in the expansion, or does the expansion fit in the original box? The answer is no. The only way you can do it is if you remove the insert, pull the insert completely out, and then move all your opponents all into this box using baggies and zip ties. Then you can get in everything all in one box if you like. I... I'm kind of a purist. I like these inserts and I actually like the extra work they put forward with these inserts. They're kind of nice and cool and I don't mind having extra boxes on my game shelf. So I haven't done it. But if you are wondering, yes, you can get everything in one box if you want, but you will have to pull that insert out and start relying on some rubber bands and some baggies, but you're good to go. Now the expansion comes with a decent amount of components and you'll notice that the corruption tokens They've taken an example from the D&D pools and they've actually made them to look like skulls, which is a cool little touch. We're not dealing with cubes for the corruption tokens. They're a different color from the base game and they're also shaped like skulls. Nice little touch. Good job there, wizards. Hopefully, you guys are going to bring out some version of your own version of the D&D pools for people who haven't been able to buy them from that guy who's been selling on Board Game Geek. I really hope you guys do. I'd like to see a little more variety. But if they don't, and you're still interested, there is a very nice guy on Board Game Geek who is selling the D&D pools, and they're basically, they're little miniatures made out of wood in the shape of the fighter, the cleric, the rogue, and the wizard, and they're painted the right color, so it looks like a little mini wizard who's colored purple, and you can buy these from him. I think they're approximately $25 or $30. I don't know. I haven't purchased them. But I've seen pictures of them and they look pretty cool and they do definitely add a lot to the theme of the game. Now the component quality matches the component quality from the original game, meaning the cardstock for the buildings is very good. It's very nice, thick cardboard, very durable, good quality there. That also comes with some game boards. It comes with three of these boards. Now they are smaller game boards, which I think is a nice plus because this game already comes with a very large game board, which means it takes up a lot of real estate on the gaming table so it's nice that the new boards are smaller so you just slip them in right next to your game board from the main game not taking up too much more room but it is three extra game boards that you're going to have to add if you do decide to use both the expansions so you will need a little bit more real estate the cards also all have their own great artwork on them again it's that same good quality artwork that we saw in the original game 
Lots of cool paintings, full color artwork on these. They look really, really nice. They're very nicely done. But again, we have the same thinner cardstock that we had with the other cards that came with the original game. Still, in my opinion, I have to say it's not a big deal because these cards aren't shuffled a lot and they really don't take a lot of wear and tear. I haven't had any problem with my base game with any of the cards wearing out and I have played the game a lot now and I never sleeve the cards. But do know the cardstock is a little bit thinner on these than what you'd get in a traditional game. But just like before, they do have a good laminate making them kind of a little bit of a rubbery card feeling to them. I think they're going to last. I haven't any problems with my other cards, but do know a little bit thinner cardstock. But the artwork on them is still really good, really fantastic, full color artwork. They did a great job there. Additionally, there are symbols on the cards and also the buildings and everything comes with this expansion. So if you want to pull stuff out or add it back in from the different expansions, you really easily can. And the way to differentiate is if you see the little beholder symbol on the card or on the building, you'll see it right down here. That means it's from the Undermountain expansion. And if you see the little symbol, it looks like a skull in flames. And again, you'll see it on the card and also on the building tiles, the skull in flames. That means it's from the skull port expansion. Pretty easy symbol to pick up on, to pull it out, to remove expansion components depending on which one of the expansions you want to play with. So if you're worried about having to pull things out, if you like one expansion better than the other, or if you want to teach new players without the expansion, it's not hard to pull these components back out of the game and start over from scratch. Now the new, this new expansion adds some really cool mechanics to the base game of Lords of Waterdeep. We'll start with the Scoundrels of Skullport part of the expansion for the Skullport because it adds the coolest new thing to the game that is really different and really changes up, I think, the way the game plays. And that's going to be the Corruption Track. Now the way the Corruption Track works is there's going to be skulls on various places. There's going to be one skull on the minus one space. And every other space has three skulls on it. If you forget, you can see it. There's little outlines of skulls all the way up to the minus seven, to the minus eight, all the way up to the minus nine. And basically, anytime you take an action that forces you to take a skull, you're basically going to take it away from the lowest numbered spot, and you're going to add that to your tavern. And these corruption tokens are going to be worth minus negative points at the end of the game. At the end of the game, you're going to add up however many skull tokens you have in your tavern, and those are going to be worth negative points into the game. And it's going to be based on how many skull tokens that have actually been removed from the corruption track. So, for example, if the corruption track is going to have this many skull tokens removed from it, every skull token that you have in your tavern is going to be worth minus three points. So, if you have seven of these in your tavern, you're going to lose 21 points at the end of the game. And it only goes up to the only space that has no skull tokens on it. So if you have this space right here that has a few skull tokens removed from it, but there's at least one left there, that means each one is only worth minus three. But if you happen to have this many skull tokens removed from the board, each one's worth minus six points. So you can see that if you have a lot of these skull tokens in your tavern, you're going to get in a lot of trouble because you're going to start losing a lot of points fast. And it's really easy to get skull tokens in this expansion because you're going to see the new board has new spaces where every single space is going to give you a skull token. And this is where the push your luck element comes in with the new skull port expansion. You'll notice these spaces give you a lot of really cool things. If you put one of your agents on this space right here, you're going to end up getting two warriors, two rogues, but of course you're going to have to take one of those skull tokens. If you put your agent over here on this space down here, you see that you get any two adventurers of your choice, but again, of course, you're going to take another skull token. Finally, we have this space over here. If you put an agent on this space, you're going to end up getting one quest card, one entry card, five coins, which is a lot of money in this game. The best spot in the original board only gives you four coins, and you're going to take a skull token. So you see that these corruption tokens while they come from spaces that give you a lot of good rewards, if you take enough of these corruption tokens, you're going to start losing a lot of points at the end of the game. Not only that, there's a whole bunch of quests that have been added to the game that actually force you, if you have any skull tokens or any corruption tokens, you cannot complete any other quest except that quest. And you have to get rid of it as long as you have corruption tokens. Of course, there are ways to get skull tokens, the corruption tokens, off of your tavern and back into the corruption track. 
and that's through various quests and entry cards but you have to be careful because there are some cards that remove skull tokens or corruption tokens permanently from the board and that means that they're not added back in they're actually removed completely from the game which kind of makes it a kind of a like I said earlier a push your luck kind of aspect to this expansion which I really really like and I think it adds a lot to the base game go ahead and show you some of the buildings that got added with the expansion too and again you're gonna start seeing they all add corruption tokens here's one you place your agent on this building you're gonna get three warriors three rogues but of course you have to take a corruption token here's another one that says return a corruption token and to gain one priest here's another really fun building that actually starts with one corruption token on at the beginning of the game if you place your agent on this space you have to take all the corruption on that building but you get to return agents to your pool to replace out on the board so again do you want to take that risk of taking on that corruption and risk losing points in the game but the ability to get extra moves out, out of it though there's also cards and buildings that allow you to move the corruption around the board this one allows you to take one corruption token out of your own tavern and place it on any building on the game board which can be really powerful and very devious if you know another player needs a certain kind of agent or a certain, I'm sorry a certain kind of adventure to complete a quest you can place that corruption token on a space that you're pretty sure they're gonna go for so they have to risk are they willing to take that corruption just to get what they need to complete that quest there's also three new lords that come with this that the skull port expansion there is one who gives you six victory points for one kind of quest that you choose at the end of the game which can be pretty powerful if you plan your questing them just right this person is going to get four victory points for each mandatory or pardon me each non-mandatory quest you complete that's actually from the skull port expansion and there are a lot of quests that come with each expansion and then finally we have this lord and he's pretty interesting he's going to gain four victory points for every corruption token in his tavern the negative to that is he still takes the corruption tokens for having the corruption tokens in his tavern in the first place so if your corruption track is at the minus four he's going to break even but if it gets to the five six or higher he's going to start taking additional negative points making him a very interesting lord indeed to play there's also some really interesting quests that come with it complete this quest gain 20 victory points but as you see you're going to gain a lot of money you're going to gain 12 money 20 victory points but three corruption tokens here's another quest that's going to give you 18 victory points an entry card plus some agents i'm sorry some adventurers but again you're going to take on three of those corruption tokens as soon as you complete that quest although you can manipulate the corruption tokens this one's a great quest it gives you 10 victory points and allows you to move three corruption tokens and actually return them back to the corruption track so as you can see the school port part of the expansion adds a lot of things to do with corruption and it adds a really neat unique mechanic with the corruption track where you're basically juggling do you want to risk losing points at the end of the game for an early bonus early on in the game with extra powerful spaces but again all those spaces are going to start giving you corruption and players can start playing cards on you to start moving that corruption around where it can get pretty damaging especially if you don't find ways to start moving that corruption from your inn now to take a look at the Undermountain expansion. Now the Undermountain expansion adds a different mechanic to the game, making it play a little bit differently. First, the big thing you're going to notice is that there's extra spaces to start gaining entry cards and also extra spaces to start playing entry cards, which is going to add more spaces and opportunities to play entry cards, which is really cool because some of the entry cards that come with the Undermountain expansion are very devious very direct and really start screwing with some of your opponents for example call for assistance is a card that allows you to take adventures out of your one of your opponents tavern and place them directly into your own tavern demolish which allows you to start destroying buildings controlled by your opponents now there's a little bit of cost of doing this but if you finally figure out that your opponent is controlling the lord that gets victory points at the end of the game for having more buildings on the board playing demolish is definitely going to hurt their score at the end of the game Another interesting card is Inevitable Betrayal, which again allows you to take any adventure and a few gold from one of your opponent's taverns. The caveat is as soon as you use this card, they get this card and they can turn around and use it against you, so be careful how you use it. Another really fun one is the Manipulate Entry card, which when combined with the 
A skull port expansion can be very devious, especially if you move an opponent's agent to a space that just happens to have a couple of extra corruption tokens on it. Of course, if you don't enjoy all the intrigue cards, there's also the card Open Lord, which allows you to become immune to all intrigue and all mandatory quest cards for the rest of the game. Again, the intrigue cards are going to be played a lot more with this expansion. They're going to get more in your hand, you're going to get more out on the board, and you're going to get a lot more of the fun and the intrigue from the intrigue cards. Especially when you start seeing entry cards like the Information Broker, which allows you to draw three entry cards, and your opponents each also get to draw further entry cards. Again, entry cards are really going to start cycling through when you throw this expansion into the base game. There's also some really cool entry cards that allow you to place adventurers on the board in various spaces. You're basically going to take a couple of adventurers from the supply, add them to your tavern, then you're going to start adding adventurers to the board on spaces that you choose, which will be additional rewards for anybody who moves to those spaces. Finally, Under Mountain brings out some of the highest point quests that we've seen in the game to date with 40 point quests. So we're not talking about one 40 point quest. We're talking about multiple quests that each give you 40 points. And in this game, 40 points is a huge amount. Now, these quests require a lot of adventures to complete, but if you can manage to complete these quests, your score is going to jump by numerous points, making very big power swings in this game. And again, this is one of those games where the best strategy is to not be in the first place, but to be in second place for as long as you can, then have all your cards fall in perfect row to come out and take first place in the end. With 40 point quests, that's going to start happening quite a bit, so you're going to have to watch your opponents very, very carefully. Undermount also has some really cool plot quests like Obtain the Builder's Plans which allows you to place an agent on a building that's in Builder's Hall that isn't even on the game board and use the abilities from that building once per turn, a really powerful ability. There's also Studying the Librarian which allows you to take an action space that allows you to play an entry card and as soon as you do that you can draw an additional entry card and play that second entry card immediately. Again, this expansion is going to allow you to fire through those entry cards get them in play, causing a lot of uproars and a lot of upheaval in this game. Really fun expansion if you're looking for that kind of modification in the base game of Lords of Waterdeep. There's also buildings that are going to allow you to place adventurers on different spaces on the board also. This one allows you to place, take gold whenever you place an agent there and put gold in your end, then put gold on the board. This one's going to allow you to take some priests and then place a priest anywhere on the board on an open action space. This one's going to allow you to take some rogues and place a rogue on an open action space. Really cool abilities. Modifies the game just a little bit, but enough to make it play a little differently and add some more strategies to an already great, great game. Undermount also comes with three new lords. There's Danilo, who's going to allow you to score three points for each non-mandatory quest you complete at the end of the game. There's Halister Black Cloak. He's allowed you to score four victory points for each non-mandatory quest you complete from the Undermountain quests. And finally there's Trobriand. He's going to allow you to score 5 victory points for each quest you complete. That's worth 10 or more points. When you look at an expansion for a game, an expansion is either going to give you more of the same, fix something that was perceived as being broken, or improve the game, make it better by adding additional mechanics. This expansion falls in the third category. This is an expansion that adds to the game, adds some really cool mechanics that change up the way the game plays just a little bit without ruining the core game, and adds a lot of fun stuff, and makes a really, really great game. A game that I consider my 2012 top game of the year, and makes it just even better. The first couple times I played the game, I played it just with the Skullport expansion, just because I wanted to try the Corruption, and it, I had a perception that the Corruption was the best part of the expansion. After I included the Undermountain and the Skullport together, I realized that they work great together. I like the rules for the longer game, basically it adds one more agent to each player, that's basically all it does. So it's going to add a little more time to the game, but allows you to do more in the game because you're getting one more agent to place get to do one more action and it's going to give you just a little more strategy when you're playing the basic game. This new expansion adds a six player to the game which is basically a no brainer. The basic board from the original game showed that we knew if there ever was an expansion that came out for Lords of Waterdeep. We knew it was going to add a six player so that wasn't a surprise there at all. We knew it was coming. 
we didn't know this corruption mechanic was coming and this corruption mechanic is really really cool I like to call it kind of a press your luck mechanic because you're constantly constantly juggling and judging okay if I take this one more corruption the corruption tracks gonna go to five I have four corruption in my pool right now my opponents can possibly give me more that's gonna be worth at least 20 minus 20 points in the game possibly minus 30 I gotta judge that but if I take this space right here, I'm gonna get four agents or four adventurers, and I really need those four adventurers to complete this quest. This quest will be worth 15 points. Is it worth gaining 15 points for the potential to lose 20 points in the game? Are my opponents gonna play those cards against me? Do they have those cards? They're holding the intrigue cards close to their chest. What are they thinking? What are they plotting? All that comes from this corruption mechanic, and I think that is just really, really awesome. It adds just another element to a game that, like I said, I already thought it was my favorite game of 2012. After I started playing around with the Undermountain expansion, I realized that it actually adds a lot to the game too. At first, I was kind of leery about it because I thought it was silly that they were starting to add 40 point quests. I thought that was a little bit excessive because you're going to start seeing big jumps with those 40 points. But I like the extra mechanics it adds in, especially with the fact that adventurers start getting put on the board. I like the abilities that come with it. and. I like how it changes by making a lot more of the intrigue cards come into play, get into players' hands. You're going to start seeing those intrigue cards moving around and coming out a lot more, which makes the game feel much more direct and interactive between the players. Now, don't get me wrong. I already thought the game was pretty good at allowing you to be interacting with the other players, but in the base game, it was possible to go through a complete game where players were only playing a couple intrigue cards against each other. Once you throw an undermount, players are going to be throwing intrigue cards at each other every single round, and I like how it changes the game. It makes it a lot more interactive, and I think it's definitely a bonus. And after I played a few times, I didn't even mind those 40-point quests because I saw how it was interacting with the rest of the rules, and it actually worked out really well, especially when you combine Undermounted with Skullport and bring up both the expansions of the game. The game is just really phenomenal once you add all that to the basic game. This new expansion does make the game a little bit swingy though, especially when you start seeing those 40 point quests coming out. Now they're not easy to complete, so don't even think that people are gonna start throwing out these 40 point quests left and right. Especially when you look at how thick the quest stack is when you include both the expansions. You're, I think there's seven of these 40 point quests and you're looking at about 150 quest cards once you throw all these quest cards together. So the chance of them coming out isn't that high but when they come out they can definitely make a difference in the score also one other thing to look out for is i'm not a hundred percent convinced that these new six lords are a hundred percent balanced against each other more play is definitely going to tell if they are balanced or if they're not so far from what i'm seeing i'm seeing a few of the lords who are really call it situational the beholder lord for example he gets minus I'm sorry, he gets four victory points for every corruption token he has in his inn. Now, if the corruption track isn't abused too much, he's not going to really suffer. He's going to come out on top on that. But if that corruption track gets really abused by other players, they figure out which lord you're using, they're going to try to abuse it and get that corruption track worth a lot of negative points. He's actually going to come out losing a lot of points in the end. But his main strength is trying to manipulate that corruption track. So he's one of those lords I'm not too sure about right now. He's going to take a lot more play for me to decide if he's worth it or not. What I have decided to do until I've decided how balanced these lords are is every time I'm playing the game, I'm giving each player two lords, and they pick which lord they want and then discard the other one without showing any of the other players. And so far, that's been pretty popular. I don't know if that's going to be too abusive, but that's what we're liking so far. The bottom line is, if you like Lords of Waterdeep, you owe it to yourself to buy this expansion. Even if you only like one aspect, if you only like the Skullport Corruption track, or you only like the Undermountain part where you get the extra entry cards and how it affects play, you're going to enjoy this expansion. It is definitely worth adding to the base game. It adds a lot to the base game, changes it up just enough without ruining the basic mechanics and the basic formula that the game is, and makes it a lot of fun without making the game overly complex, which is a definite bonus. If you like Lords of the Waterdeep, you need to pick up Scoundrels of Skullport. This has been another Off the Shelf Board Game Review. Thanks for watching.